celiac diagnosis, um, improve and resolve symptoms, improve intestinal absorption, and also reduce the risk of complications for celiac disease, such as osteoporosis. So what is gluten? Gluten um, is actually a type of protein that is naturally found in wheat, barley, and rye, and it provides structure and uh, elasticity to baked goods. So where can gluten be found? Um, I like to use an acronym called BROW, so barley, wheat, oats, and wheat. So in barley, um, there's a list kind of here, some things I wanna point out. <clears throat> so just aside from barley, um, malt tends to be one that has kind of, it's hidden in a lot of different ingredients, um, but it does contain um, gluten. Um, most beers are made with barley, so that also contains gluten. Um, rye products. Um, oats is kind of a, um, interesting area where, you know, oats are generally gluten-free. However, they are often processed in facilities where other um, wheat uh, gluten-containing products are processed. So there's a lot of risk of cross-contamination. Um, but if it is certified gluten-free oats, those are much safer and tend to be gluten-free. Um, and then the whole list of products that are made from wheat. So um, things to look out for when you're looking for foods that might contain gluten. So obviously the main ones, wheat, barley, rye, oats. Um, also some ones that you may not think of that are that can be made from wheat or other gluten containing items. So starch, modified food starch, dextrin, brewer's yeast, and malt like I mentioned before. Um, so some foods may contain these hidden sources of gluten, such as sauces and gravies, um, especially if it's used as a thickener. Um, soups can also contain some hidden sources, salad dressings and marinades, mixed spices, imitation meat and seafood, processed meat products, candy, medicines may, and also vitamins and supplements. But there's also a pretty good amount of gluten-free starches and grains. Um, so here's kind of a list of different types of grains and flours that do not contain um, gluten. Um, common things that we think about, so ones that are made from soy, made from rice, corn, um, quinoa is also gluten-free, um, and then ones that may not be as common like tapioca, arrowroot, arrowroot buckwheat, and then there is um, honestly a whole list of foods that are just naturally gluten-free. So all fruits and vegetables that have not been altered and their juices, um, fresh and frozen, um, unprocessed proteins. So um, meats, poultry, fish, seafood, um, eggs, tofu are also naturally gluten-free. And then legumes and nuts. So beans, chickpeas, most, you know, plain nuts and plain seeds, um, dairy products. So like milk, um, yogurt, cottage cheese. Um, so non-dairy beverages, I would just make sure it's labeled gluten-free um, or you want to check the ingredients because sometimes they may have some like starch or something added in as a thickener or something. So just be a little bit careful with non-dairy um, milk alternatives. And then beverages, so like water, tea, coffee, juice, soda, sports drinks, and um, many common condiments tend to be naturally gluten-free, ketchup, mustard, mayonnaise. But again, I would always check the ingredients list just to make sure there's no hidden sources of gluten in there. Um, so that's the end of my presentation, and I'm going to pass it on to Anna Varen for um, the next piece. Thanks so much, Sandy. Appreciate it. I'm going to share my slides real quick. Give me one moment. Okay. And can you guys see? Let's see. 
maybe Leah, you can tell me if the view is good of my first page. It is good. It is good. Perfect. Okay. Well, wonderful. Well, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Anna Varen, and I'm a psychologist here in our Celiac Center at Stanford Children's Health, and really thrilled to be here tonight. Um, my part of the talk following up on Sandy's is kind of intro to gluten-free diet, now really shifting to psychological and social aspects of celiac disease, of course, including the gluten-free diet. Let's, so sorry. Okay. Are we still okay view-wise? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Perfect. Um, so tonight, just briefly discussing psychological and social impacts of celiac disease, and then going into exploring the brain gut connection, which I find particularly fascinating, um, and especially in celiac. And then lastly, ending with coping and discussing a little bit about how to cope with the psychological and social challenges of celiac disease. So as most everyone, or let's just say everyone here on this call does not, knows that celiac can really impact all parts of one's life. So whether you're struggling with active symptoms around a new diagnosis or related to gluten exposure or experiencing stress related to the diet or gluten-free diet, celiac generally, it really can impact all parts of your life from home life to social life to schoolwork and hobbies as are listed here. And when many people think about um, the gluten-free diet and celiac, they really just think of the common physical symptoms or thinking of restrictions of the diet. They don't think about the significant psychological and social, or as you'll see here, psychosocial impacts of one's life. And there's here, it's a real sort of hard to read on the slide, but a really interesting and very accurate um, infogram from Beyond Celiac that I recommend checking out to look at really all parts of life that um, celiac can impact. And as we consider the psychosocial, the psychological and social impacts of celiac, it's important to highlight the research, or I think it's really important to highlight the research that's shown celiac is associated with mental health conditions in children and adults and mental health challenges. So here, as you, you can see, it's um, depression, so associated with several conditions in children and adults, such as depression, anxiety, eating disorders, um, ADHD, and autism. And I think it's really important to note with this research that the elevated risk of mental health challenges has been found both preceding diagnosis when there's more inflammation in the body and following diagnosis while on a gluten-free diet. And depression and anxiety specifically have been associated with worse rates of compliance to the gluten-free diet. Additionally, when we zoom into children, as that sort of my realm is pediatric, um, about a third have a co-occurring mental health condition who have celiac. And these rates are higher than those in the general population of children. And in children with celiac, um, there is a 1.4 times greater risk of a future mental health condition. Equally is important to highlight that many social factors contribute to these higher rates of mental health conditions and challenges after diagnosis of celiac and also when on a gluten-free diet. So these types of social factors really include things like dietary restrictions or limited food choices in certain areas such as school or concerns about cross-contamination, um, social events, feelings of social isolation, and also really just stigma of being on a more restrictive diet. And then, of course, there are also social factors such as financial costs and struggles and food insecurity that can absolutely play into mental health. So the take home really is that celiac can impact and greatly impact mental health and quality of life, both around diagnosis or when there's been contamination and impact on our body and when in remission. So I would like to spend just a few minutes here to go a little bit more in depth about the topic of psychological functioning and mental health and celiac. And research has shown that untreated celiac disease can have a really big, big impact on our brain. Um, and that impacts our emotions, our cognitive functioning and our behavior. And this occurs because we have this really strong brain gut connection. And I imagine many people online tonight on the Zoom are familiar with this 
brain gut connection, or you've heard about it in the media, you've read about it yourself, or you've read the research, but truly in the simplest of forms, our brain and our gut, so our lovely photo here, our brain and our gut, are just in constant communication and they each impact the other. So there are lots of um, expressions that we hear really every day or in the, you know kind of common colloquial terms, such as I have a gut feeling or I have butterflies in my stomach. Um, one of my favorites are as I have a knot in my stomach. And all of these expressions really speak to that brain gut connection and how people can really feel and experience emotions in their gut. And a really interesting fact is that our gut and our GI tract are really, um, as they're in constant communication, our gut is considered our second brain. And it actually has its own nervous system, which is called the enteric nervous system. And this brain gut connection, sort of one nervous system communicating to another, another nervous system, impacts so many parts of our health. Um, and it really impacts many chronic conditions. But when we zoom into celiac, there's a few ways that this, con this connection, this brain gut connection can really impact the mental health of a person who has celiac um, and when it's untreated and they have not been managed by the gluten-free diet. So first of all, it can lead to damage villi in our small intestine that actually impact our body's ability to make key neuro neurotransmitters that impact our mental health. So things that people may have heard of serotonin, um, dopamine, norepinephrine, and there's really this biochemical imbalance that impact our emotional health. Now, second, inflammation in intestines that can produce that can produce a stress hormone in the body, which can impact our brain and our emotions. And lastly, living with act active symptoms can lead people to not want to go outside, you know, to really isolate from others, which can also sort of behaviorally contribute to low mood and anxiety. So all of this research has shown that, you know, with treatment to ad adherence to the gluten-free diet, some of these mental health challenges really can improve, especially in kids. So things like anxiety decreasing, um, given this brain gut connection and healing our gut. However, living with a chronic condition and following a really strict daily diet can be very hard for many people. And mental health is absolutely impacted, even when um, being on a gluten-free diet and really treating celiac. So given that, it is very clear, all of this points to the very clear need for more psychological and social support with individuals with celiac disease. And when we think about the most effective strategies, um, for managing and providing psychological and social support, there really are a mix of strategies and no one is completely correct or right. It's just certain things work for certain people, certain things you can do on your own, and some involve more professional or community organizations. So just gonna highlight a few that we often recommend in our celiac clinic, um, best way to support psychosocial health and well-being for individuals with celiac. May not surprise you given this talk, but first and foremost is just staying adherent to the diet and really treating celiac and having your GI tract be healthy that can impact your brain and well being, as we just spoke about in depth. And second, just active communication with the team. This is so important around diagnosis and kind of throughout your journey with celiac to really talk about some of the psychological and social challenges you're facing if they are coming up for you. And that can really allow time for your team to provide education or reassurance or support, really problem solve together and can lead to referrals to mental health providers if needed. Second or third, I should say, excuse me, is setting up school accommodations or work accommodations. This is key to psychosocial health as this allows A, for access to gluten-free food at settings outside of your home, such as school, and supportive measures to help you succeed academically and professionally and really feel less stressed in these domains. Fourth is really setting up, excuse me, there we go, fourth, a healthy lifestyle. So our lifestyle has a big impact on our physical and emotional health. Um, so regular exercise is huge, helps our bodies stay active, um, can big impact on our physical health. Also being active and being on sports teams really can help us socially connect socially to others. And getting good sleep helps our bodies be healthy, impacts our mood positively and our emotions. And we're really just better able to cope and regulate our emotions and cope with stress when we've had a good night's sleep. Now, fifth, seeking emotional support is huge when we're thinking of facing psychosocial challenges with celiac. So being able to express and share your emotions, really feel heard and validated is so important with celiac. And of course, and there's a time and a place after sharing, 
to lead to problem solving around celiac and the gluten-free diet. And the person you share with could be a parent, a friend, a significant other, someone on your medical team, anyone you feel comfortable with. And six, managing stress is huge to celiac. And of course, generally in life, it's really important to our physical and mental health. But with this brain gut connection we've talked about, uh, it's extra important to find effective ways to manage our stress. And so they can be things that we've already talked about, good communication, um, good exercise, sleeping well, but also doing things you enjoy, whether that's um, uh, playing a sport out, you know, on a team or gardening or shopping or drawing. It's whatever you enjoy that brings you happiness can really help manage stress. And also really trying to find things that help us calm down and relax, like reading or taking a bath or listening to music um, or more active relaxation exercises that engage our relaxation response. Some people love meditation or yoga or massage. These things can be very, very helpful um, in sort of shifting our mood, helping to calm our bodies and again, engage that relaxation response. In seventh, if you're really experiencing high levels of emotional distress, um, finding a provider, a mental health therapist can be really helpful. And if you're on our team, talking to someone on our team, getting referred to me or our social worker or your main GI provider can be really helpful here. And lastly, um, really seeking out a local celiac community and building a celiac support system is huge. It can be really powerful to support yourself, a way, really powerful way to support yourself socially and emotionally and helping you feel more connected and less alone with celiac and managing the gluten-free diet. So joining a local support group, um, going to a celiac camp, becoming more involved in a celiac chapter, or coming to events like this tonight, a way to learn and connect with others is a wonderful way um, to really support yourself on a psychological and social level. So these are just eight strategies listed here. There are so many more. These are just some of the tips we recommend at our clinic. And I am happy to talk more about this, but want to continue to move our presentation along tonight. Um, and I will pause now and pass to Jonathan. Um, and we, let me end this, and then we will keep talking and can answer questions after. So thank you. Thank you, Anava. Hi, everybody. I'm Jonathan Avila. I'm one of the adolescent medicine physicians at Stanford Children's. Many people don't know what adolescent medicine that, that is even a thing. Um, basically, I'm a pediatrician who did three additional years of training specializing in adolescent health and how to promote health and well-being in, during adolescent development and young adulthood. And part of that, and that's across all domains, part of that includes dating and sexual health, intimacy, reproductive health, which brings to the topic of uh, this webinar for my section, which is dating and uh, celiac disease. The If you look at medical literature and do a search on, on celiac and dating or sexual health or any sort of permutation uh, of, of the topic, you'll find a number of studies that you can count with one hand and still have free remaining fingers to do knitting or crocheting or whatever craft you want to do. But when you do look at Google searches, what people are searching online or even at Reddit or other forums, it's a way, way, way bigger number than that. More than one handful or two or three or four or five. So it's a lot, there are a lot, a lot of questions about dating and sexual health when you have celiac versus what we actually know. So take with what I say with a grain of salt. The number the number one question that was um, typed in Google was, can I get gluten exposure through kissing or some other variation of the, of the topic uh, on gluten and kissing? That was the number one, also very, very common in the forums as well. And the number two question was, what birth control doesn't have gluten? Or what is the birth control is writing for me when I have celiac disease? Or whatever permutation of that question, something along those topics. So it's really kissing and contraception. Those are the main topics. And if you have more questions about that, those or additional questions beyond those two, we'll be happy to address those in the Q&A later on. We'll talk about those two questions. But before we do, those two questions that actually do not address the main struggle 
of, of, of celiac and disease and dating. There was a, a large survey, over 500 uh, people, mostly young adults, so no, no teenagers, but mostly young adults on dating, and that was done in New York. And uh, about half of the individuals actually said in that survey that they were hesitant to go out on dates because of their gluten-free diet. 40% were very hesitant to kiss their their partner or whoever in the day. And so that, that goes along with her question, the, the, the most Googled question, so to speak, or research question online. But interesting enough to me, and also 70% uh, of the uh, participants said that having or following a gluten-free diet impacted their dating life, either major, severely so, or moderately. And that's a huge number. And that does not match just the kissing part or the contraception part. About 43% of people so, um, or so, they felt comfortable. So less than half felt comfortable talking about their diagnosis before their first date, even though only 14%, like a small, small, small number, talked about it in their online dating profile and things along those lines, uh, things along those lines. There was a lot, there were a lot of fears and anxieties, as one you can imagine, of navigating not only the world, not only navigating the dating world as a teenager, but navigating that world as a teenager and adding uh, celiac disease on top of it. So even though this study was a young adult and not really teenagers, but it talked a lot about those fears and anxieties. So for example, a common theme in that survey was about not having control over a situation, which is a common feeling we all have when we're dating. Um, I'm not dating right now, but my grandma, who's 85, is dating and looking for a seventh husband. So if anybody knows somebody, please connect with me afterwards. Um, but it, there's a lot of anxiety added on to that uh, as far as being a teenager and then another one as part of being uh, of having uh, of celiac disease. About almost 80% of people said they try to control their dating some way without having to disclose. So for instance, they may have control over um, where they're going to date, what kind of dating. Most dating, just like a lot of social interactions, occur around food. Um, they, they try to navigate a little bit of that, what restaurant they're going, or maybe they're going to do a bring your own food, sort of brown bag or a picnic style, or maybe they will be checking a place where they already know they're comfortable, they know the menu and, and so on and so forth. Uh, there's a lot of control involved, which is very common when we're anxious or have, uh, fears. We want to be in control because part of feeling anxious and, and having fears is not having the control and not knowing. That being said, most people did not feel very comfortable at the restaurant during their day talking to the waiter about what about the menu in more detail. So in that survey, about 40% of people actually did what the, 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 the researchers call the risk eating. You're eating, you're not really know what is in there. You don't think there's gluten, but you haven't checked and you don't want to check and so on and so forth. And there's about a 10% of people who actually ate foods or, or meals that they ordered that they knew it contained gluten because they didn't want to disclose, they didn't want to talk about it, or they didn't want it to be a big deal about it, they didn't want it to be a factor in their dating. And the, the core of all of this, I think, is the this idea or almost internalized embarrassment or shame or something negative or stigma about following a gluten-free diet, which is is which is sad. But that is the major part of the struggles with dating when you're following a gluten-free diet. The uh, and there are many ways around it. And obviously, I love uh, positive thinking and saying um, such as. Like I tell my grandma, um, it's not, it's, it's, it's just the first date. It's, 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 it's for you to get to know each other. It's, um, you know, don't stress over it. Um, it's, uh, you're supposed to have fun in the process. Just don't worry about it. It's not about getting a second date. It's not about getting a kiss, but it's so much easier said than done. Like when we are on it, when we're the ones dating, when you're at it, that's, we obviously want to 
to look good and make a good impression and be liked. And so the when we have some sort of differences or when we're part of um, any groups that could are minoritized, then we feel a little bit, oh, uh, maybe I don't want to disclose it, this and that. So there's a lot of this internalized negativity that I think is the core of everything. And we we we, we could, like Dr. Wen was talking about, the importance of building community and building positivity around um, going to summer camps or, 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 or um, uh, other ways of support systems around it so that you can it's giving something normalizing it is the the core of uh, the core of it but back to the dating the, the dating the the kiss question so 40 like i said 40 percent of people did not want to they uh they want to kiss because they weren't sure if you're going to get gluten exposure through kissing or not so what is the is that true is that not true what what is out there the data is very limited, and honestly, there's not good data on the on the gluten per se. So a lot of what we we know, we think we know, we're extrapolating from peanut allergy and people who have anaphylaxis and severe allergy reactions from peanut, and what happens with that in the saliva, since kissing is really saliva exchange. I don't mean to be gross, but it is what it is. Um, the the bottom line is that it's very, very, very unlikely that kissing will significantly expose somebody to a significant amount of gluten that will lead to a gastrointestinal symptom. So yes, you don't need to you don't need to not kiss and not tell about about following a gluten free diet. You can you can tell and you can kiss. Um, obviously varies. Um, so um, obviously if, if, if the other person has a lot of uh, bread in, in their mouth or their teeth, it's a little bit story, different story, but, and also the way somebody kisses is also, also a different story. But in general, when we look at how much gluten there is in saliva after um, somebody, for instance, ate um, a cake that has a lot of gluten, for instance, it's it's tiny, 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 tiny amount that shouldn't cause um, symptoms. As far as birth control, so it's a similar answer as far as, um, let's talk about birth control pills. There are many types of contraception, but birth control pills was the one that was most Googled and, 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 and talked about in forums. So uh, the hormone itself doesn't cause any problem. Um, it's more about what is being using as the binding product in those pills. So most pills, whatever medication that is, is going to use some sort of binding ingredient. We often call those excipient ingredients, but that's, I don't know, that's too fancy of a name. Um, I just like it because it has excipient, like recipient, but it's that X since we're talking about dating. But anyway, um, the... Most common ingredients used in as an excipient or the binding ingredient is not going to be uh, not going to cause having gluten problems or issues. Um, they are going to be using pre-gelatinized starch, um, and most of it most of it can come from corn, potato, rice. Is that me? I think that is me playing playing of music. Is that my computer? Okay, I don't know whose computer is my computer. I'm sorry. I'm assuming it's me because I'm assuming everybody else is muted. But um, I heard music. Sorry. So um, back on the secret ingredient. So um, the majority of part you're not going to have it now. Like we like Sandy talked about earlier. She talked about dextrins. So dextrins with an I N at the end, that can that is a derivative of any starch source. So if that's the ingredient in the birth control pill or the whatever pill, um, that you I if you really want to know if that's uh, uh how much gluten there is or if it's safe, um, you'd have to call the manufacturer to confirm it. Altogether six stitches. All the stitches. Am I hearing? I am hearing things. No, I hear it too, but I I it went away. And now it's okay. Fine. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is okay. So, um, um, the other, um, ingredients you may see in birth controls, you may, uh, dextrans with an A N, 
uh, that is different than dextrin with an IN. So Sandy said in, in her slide, she talked about dextrins, but dextrans are usually derived from corn or potato starch, so they don't contain gluten, they should be safe. You may see some starch alcohol. So from Sandy's slide, she talked about malt. So there's an alcohol, a derivative of alcohol from that called maltitol. Uh, you may be familiar with xylitol or mannitol, and they are usually derived from wheat, but they're purified so they no longer contain gluten. So for the majority of pills and birth control pills, uh, it shouldn't be a problem um, unless they have dextrins in it. And even then you might want to call the manufacturer to see, but if you really don't want to risk, you don't want to call the manufacturer, you want to, you want to know, because unfortunately the FDA does not regulate uh, the amount of gluten or what kind of starch it's used. So we don't know and without calling the manufacturer, but if you don't know, or if you want to be sure, there are many other types of contraceptives that we can um, talk about and discuss that we don't, that don't have binding ingredients or starches that, um, that should cause any problem or worry. If anybody has any other questions about, Dating, whether it's one of those top two or more questions about the two, this is a great time. Um, I think, Leah, we uh, to open a Q&A, not just for me, but for uh, Sandy and Dr. Wren. I will. I'll go ahead and stop the recording and then we can go to Q&A.